Welcome to the GoTo Podcast. Each episode covers the brightest and boldest ideas from the world's leading experts in software development. Tune in for practical lessons, compelling theories, and plenty of inspiration. GoTo gathers the brightest minds in the software community to help developers tackle projects today, plan for tomorrow, and create a better future. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in cities like Amsterdam, London, Copenhagen, and Chicago, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conference's YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. Hello, my name is Anne Curry, and I am one of the co-authors of the new O'Reilly book, Building Green Software, which is being serialized on the O'Reilly website as we write it, as we uh, go through. As, we, as each episode comes live on the website, we're also talking about it here at the GoTo podcast. And the next chapter that we're going to talk about is networking, green networking. And the reason why... We added a chapter called Green Networking because it was because suddenly I started to see, we started to see all over the place in tech newspapers and, and even real newspapers, stats saying the internet uses the same amount of electricity as a small country. And that needs to, that needs to be better. That needs to stop. And so uh, we, we decided, well, actually, let's, let's go find that. Let's dig into that a little bit and, and, and find out what's, what's causing that and uh, what we need to do about it. So. So we started to look into this. And of course, the first question you have to ask is, is it plausible? Yes, it is. It is entirely plausible. The internet is a huge machine, the biggest uh, kind of meta machine that humanity has ever created. So it's not surprising that it uses a great deal of electricity. But what do they actually mean by the internet? I think when, when they're talking about that kind of stat, what they're really talking about is the internet being all the way up. Soup to nuts. It's the, it's the wires, it's the intercity cables, it's the, it's the connections at the bottom, uh, the um, the switches, the routers, uh, the, the things like CDNs that help you pass data around all the way up to applications running in data centers. So all of that is what they're really talking about there when they say that the internet is the footprint of a, of a small country. Everything has to be reduced. Every, everything has to become more efficient. Everything has to, to go to zero carbon. It's useful to know where you're targeting your efforts. Because generally we find, whenever we look at these kind of things, that there are some areas that are, are just really bad, are just hemorrhaging energy, hen- causing huge amounts of carbon to come into the atmosphere and some bits that are not. So it's well worth doing a bit of a dive into what we actually mean by the internet in, in that statement and, and where the energy is, is, is being spent. So let's, let's look at the bottom first, at the, the, at the what, what if, if you were as somebody who was a network ex, networking expert would would consider to be the network, so the fiber optic cables, the routers and switches. Now, the interesting thing about those is that they are very, very optimized to be energy efficient. Networking is, is something that a lot of the decisions in networking focus around a metric called watts per bit, and all networking experts focus on on reducing that metric as far as possible. Now, watts per bit is not the same as carbon emitted per bit, but it is a, a reasonable proxy for it. So we know that loads of folk are putting low, uh, lots and lots of attention into making that as efficient as possible. And as a result, the internet, the wires and the, the switch, switches and routers in the internet are really quite effect, uh, uh, really quite efficient. In fact, it's generally considered that in a data center, if you go for a data center, and you, you, you map out where the energy is being used in that data center, then about in a modern one, about 10% of the power goes to that kind of low level networking stuff. 90% goes to applications. So, and, and there's really no reason to now in an older data center with older networking equipment, it's higher, but more, more modern stuff, the networking, the networking equipment is really quiet. So that's probably not our low hanging fruit here. We've got, we could look at the 10%, but we're probably better off looking at the 90%. We've got a lot of efficiency there. We've got our watts per bit metric that we're, that we're optimizing against. But what is, is there other things that we could do? Could we do, could we do, be doing more demand shifting? This is something I hear green activists ask, asking about quite often. Could we be demand shifting the traffic on the internet? So 
Uh, traffic on the internet is rooted with a protocol called BGP, Border Gateway Protocol. And it's, 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 is what's been rooting the internet since its inception pr pretty much on the modern internet. And it works incredibly well. The internet, so the bits of the internet come down, but the internet as a whole does not come down, which is an amazing, it's a miracle. And at the moment, BGP routes packets based on, mostly based on kind of just trying to get it to where it needs to go as quickly and is, is as, with as few hops as possible. There's a little bit of additional stuff they do about relationships between ISPs and things like that. But basically, it's, it's optimizing for getting stuff uh, from A to B as quickly as possible. But a lot of green activists are saying, well, could it be routing based on, on carbon intensity data as well? Could it be saying, oh, well, I'll route into countries where the grid is currently green and routes away from countries where the, where the grid is, is, is fossil fuel powered. Now, I spoke to quite a few networking experts about this to ask if that was a good idea. And the resounding answer was no, really don't do that. It's the internet. It's amazing how well the internet works. It's, a, it's, it is astonishing that it works at all, really. And it does work. It doesn't just work a bit. It works amazingly well. It's incredibly resilient. But a lot of that, how that has happened is based on the fact that BGP is very simple, but very powerful. It's been around for a long time. It's very embedded in. And a lot of the, the internet is vastly more complicated than you think it is. And so it is even more impressive that it's, that it, it works. And a lot of the behavior of the internet, there are all of the reason why it does work is more emergent than we might like to think. So we don't, we can muck around with it and we will need to update, uh, up, upgrade BGP in the long run. But it is a big, big project and a, a many decade long project and, and quite a scary project. So if BGP was a massive cause of all that energy use in, uh, 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 was low hanging fruit, it was the biggest cause of, of the energy that was being used by the internet, then, then I'd be saying, oh, well, maybe we do need to be looking at doing something quite so radical as, as updating it, even though that's a, a multi-decade project. But given that it isn't, given that 90% of the energy use that we're talking about when we talk about the, the internet is at the application layer, we definitely don't want to start mocking around with BGP. There's lower hanging fruit higher up the stack. So what kind of things are we talking about here? So once a packet leaves a data center guided by BGP and across these very efficient, because fiber optic cable is very efficient compared to, for example, copper. Uh, once, it, once your packet from London to Paris leaves your London data center, it gets the Paris data center pretty efficiently, pretty directly. It doesn't go around the globe 20 times searching for Paris and then finally get there. It does generally get to Paris quite efficiently. But before it leaves the data center, your packet can can do all kinds of crazy stuff. It it might be it might go through very expensive service meshes and go through acquire loads and loads of additional layers and then be unwound from loads and loads of additional layers. It can bash back and forth between your microservices. It can it can be saved an unnecessarily large number of copies. It could be compressed badly or not compressed well or not compressed at all when it needs to be. There's so much stuff that can happen above what we discovered above the network layer around networking that it really, it really dwarfs any improvement we can make in networks themselves, especially as the networks are already focused on kind of green software analogous metric, which is what's per bit. So if we don't want to be changing networks, what can we be doing? What's, what should we be thinking about when we think about uh, networks? Well, we should be thinking about learning from them. So as I said before, the, the survival of the internet during the pandemic, when there was a sudden increased demand for networking resources of 50%, with no time to put in additional new, um, no, no time to lay new cables, no time, no time to do anything. It was amazing. The internet survived that. And uh, the way it did was something which is going to be utterly, utterly key to the energy transition, which is the internet and the applications running on the internet survived the lockdown, the pandemic lockdowns using demand shifting and demand shaping. Now, demand shifting and demand shaping is something that I've talked about previously around green software, because it's, it's a, it's a concept that uh, we're going to have to get used to 
because of the fact that green power is not always available. Sun's not always shining, the wind's not always blowing. Uh, and one way of handling that is by shifting work to times when the energy on the grid is green, shifting it away from when it's dirty and fossil fuel powered. And we have an excellent example of something that does that all the time in the, net, in the internet, in the users, in the applications that sit on the internet. Now, they don't shift because of energy, because energy is at the moment, it's fossil fuel that's available that they can switch and nobody's have to, having to demand shift or shape for that, but although they will. But what internet applications are very used to is demand shifting and demand shaping based on bandwidth availability. And it's that the astonishing ability of applications to do that, which is what allowed the internet to survive the, the pandemic lockdowns. And the internet was two absolutely great examples of demand shifting and then demand shaping. So uh, a great example that you can learn from from, uh, from the internet of demand shifting is the use of CDNs, content delivery networks. Now, if you, you may be familiar with that, things like Cloudflare, the idea is that you move an asset, a big asset into position somewhere close to where end users are gonna want to, to access it at some point beforehand, and then the users access it later. Now. In the old days, CDNs were mostly used to give end users faster action, access to, to videos or whatever big, big asset that they, they wanted to see that was stored on the CDN and moved into position in advance. Because it gives, it gives the users the, the false impression that it just got to them very quickly. But in fact, it's a magic trick. It was already, it was already nearby. But it, during the lockdowns, it wasn't. And, and in fact, more generally now, it's always used to give users better performance. Sometimes it's used to even out the bandwidth pressure on the internet. So if you move an asset when there's no demand for it and there's no demand on the internet generally, so you move an asset overnight, then it's already there and it only has to go a shorter uh, hop when somebody is demanding it real time at 5 p.m. when they get home and their kids turn on the television. So that is, a, that is absolutely a classic example of demand shifting, that you you fulfill the demand in advance, so you only have to do a small amount on, on literally on demand. Now, I mean, it's in some ways, it's a bit of a misnomer because it's not demand shifting. The demand hasn't shifted. The work has shifted. The demand is still exactly, it happens exactly when the demand was always going to happen, but it's fulfilled using work that was, that was shifted in time to when there wasn't other, other pressure on the, on the systems. So CDNs, Excellent example of demand shifting. One of the main reasons why the internet survived uh, 2020. Another great example of why it survived is uh, demand shaping. So, and a good example of that is in Europe, Netflix moved their programming from all being HD, which is the usual uh, situation, to all being standard definition, SD. And that massively reduced the amount of traffic there was flowing around on the internet. Uh, and that was a, that was a genuine example of demand shaping. The real demand was people wanted something to watch, and you know they could live with it being downgraded to to SD from from HD. So in the in the chapter we put in some more examples of that. The lesson here is: don't rewrite BGP. It's not your low hanging fruit. Do learn from the lessons of the pandemic. And look at what networking did and look at how all applications handle variably available bandwidth when it comes to how you're going to handle variably available power. The internet and the net and networking provides you loads and loads of prior art you can dig into and look at and see what genuinely is and has been successful. So thank you very much indeed. I was lovely to talk to you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the GoTo Podcast. Head over to gotopia.tech to discover lots more content from the brightest minds in software development.